All right. So this is what I was telling you. We're going to have little videos of everything that goes on here, and they're on YouTube. They'll continue to be available all along. So this is the simple overview. And the next thing is probably the main thing. And in a two-hour workshop, this may very well be the only thing you use. The threat hunting with Splunk. This is a contest that Splunk created and put on a couple of years ago, and it was very wonderful, and I loved it. So I got their data when they made it public, and I put up a public server so people can practice and learn Splunk. And if you don't know Splunk, you should learn it. So let me find my opera, which is the browser I put it on, which has somehow vanished on me. Okay. All right. Yes. Ah, here it is. Good. All right. And so there's a uh, server here. Let's get rid of this nonsense. Splunk. Dot Sam's class done info. All right. And you need a username and password, which is student one, student one, to get in. And then you have Splunk. And so let me just, uh, we'll come back to the live demo and you'll be solving some challenges using it. But let me just talk a little bit about the overview here. Eh, I'll just use that live demo. So here, uh, there are all kinds of uh, add-ons to Splunk, but I don't care about that. We're just going to use search and reporting, the simple basic Splunk. And the point of this is uh, Splunk is very expensive and very popular, and it does something that is extremely useful. You configure log agents all over your network. You put them on your web server and your firewall and everywhere, and they all send data back to a central point, and that goes into Splunk. And all Splunk is is the search engine to search through all those log files. It's Google for log data. So you can search for things, and it'll show you the events. And in order to make you pay for it, they have a free version, and the limitations of the free version are this. You cannot monitor very much live data, but you can monitor all the archived old data you want, and everybody is always logged in as administrator all the time. So, of course, you can't really use that in a production environment. And I really appreciate this because it's good for training. You can totally set up a server using the free version, and students can practice. Um, and, and they learn all the features. And, you know, that's, that's, it's a good balance. So this is one of those free servers. And I have two of them. And I have images to restore them when they get hacked because, of course, it's pretty easy to hack them. When I spun it up yesterday, I found that somebody had totally hacked one of them. So I just restored it from an image. So what we have here is about a million events from four years ago when the Splunk people made this. And what they did was make a little network with several things you'd find in a corporation, like an email server and a web server and so on, and then attack it with a bunch of attack tools and then record the traffic and archive it. So if I search, you typically put an index name here. Now this, it doesn't really matter for this data because there's only one set of data, but in a larger network, you'd split your data up into various indexes. And the index for this is bots v1 for boss of the sock version one. And you can specify it here. And if you search, you'll find no events. Well, no, no significant events. These are old events. Let me go back to the raw search page and point out a summary of the type of data. Here you see a summary of the data. So it shows you I have about a million events, mostly four years ago. If you hit the data summary, you can see what kind of events are here. Now, here's the host names, which you might have assigned to your servers. But in this case, I'd rather see the sources. So here, the sources are really important to understand. And this is the hard part about Splunk. The search engine is very simple, like Google. The difficulty is in the nature of the data, which is the same problem Google faces. You have the internet all full of web pages, and they're not organized in any way. They don't have the same format. They don't have keywords. And it's the same problem as Splunk. You have all these different sources of data. There's Suricata, which is an intrusion detection system that de detects events. You have Windows event logs. You have Windows registry entries. Um, you've got Sysmon, which gets data from Windows event logs and reorganizes it. And you've got stream data. You can turn on stream monitoring in Splunk. And then from sensitive points you set up in your network, it will, wander, it will detect the network traffic and make a record of what type of network traffic went by. It doesn't record every packet, but it records a summary of each stream the way NetFlow would from Cisco. So you've got TCP and uh, DHCP and DNS and HTTP and so on. Uh, so these are all different kinds of data, and they're all just 
pot, thrown together into a big database. So if you start searching, I'll put my index back in here, just because it's a good practice to specify it. And I, if I search, as I did before, you get just a few events and they're not interesting events. Um, because the real data is four years old and by default, it only looks at the last 24 hours. So I have to go to all time and it'll be really slow doing this search. So to make it faster, I'm gonna do event sampling of one in a hundred. So I only see 1% of the results because I'm trying not to find a specific attack or anything right now. I'm just trying to see how it works. So here's what you have. You have log entries. This whole block of text is just a raw log entry from some device. And here's another, and they call these things events. So if you're really new to it, you might read log events one by one. But of course, you could have just done that in a text editor. That's what people did before there were products like Splunk. You'd use grep or something and just search through log entries. And the whole point of Splunk is it makes it easier to hunt through a vast pile of events and find the interesting stuff. One of the things that makes it easy is it picks fields that look interesting and puts them here so you can click on them. So here's host and source type. If I click source type, it shows me the source types that are here and how many events have them. And I can focus in on one like HTTP. If I want to see web traffic, I can just click that and it will then limit it to just the web packets. And there are, of course, fewer of them. And now over here, I'll see logs about web traffic. And those, of course, have stuff like HTML here that was sent back and HTTP error messages and so on. So let me go back to my instructions and I'll put it over here. All right. So the first thing we want to do, almost all the data in this data set is, in fact, suspicious attack traffic because I just chose the smallest database to make it simpler. So I want to look at just the HTTP. Yep. Okay. Now, um, if I, this right now is showing me all the HTTP traffic on the network, but I want to see the HTTP traffic that went to our web server. And for this simulation, they used this domain name called I'm really not Batman. I'm really not Batman.com is the name of the web server. So now if I search here, I'm looking for HTTP traffic going to my web server because, and you just put a word here without name equals value. It just looks for that word anywhere in the log entry, just like grep or Google would. So the only traffic that would have that domain in it is going to be traffic going to my web server. So here it comes and you see, I have 209 events and I'm going to get rid of the sampling now so I can see them all. It shows the most recent event on top. And do I have to hit this? Oh, okay. Looks like maybe too many people are on this server right now and it's being slow. I'm going to try my second one. That's fine. That's why I have two. They do tend to get busy when a lot of people start using it. That's why if you want things to go faster, you use event sampling. But anyway, uh, let's see if this one responds quickly enough. So I wanted to do index equal bots v1 and stream uh, HTTP stream, which I forget how to do. Uh, it's in my instructions. I'm sure there's st source type equals stream HTTP. You have right type there. queries up here if you don't want to pick them off the menu. And I'm really not Batman. There we are. All right. And all time. I'll see if this one's going to be quick enough in responding. There we go. Okay, now it's not done yet because I don't see a check mark, but it's found some of the events and it might take a little while to get up to all of them. I think it's eventually going to find 15,000, but we might already have enough to see what I wanted to see. Uh, this one here looks like a normal request. If I just scroll down and look at these requests, I don't usually have to look too far. Yep, here, this is what I wanted to see. This is a vulnerability scanner. And these guys apparently got a copy of a commercial vulnerability scanner called Acunetics, and they didn't modify it. And commercial vulnerability scanners do not want to be used for crime. So by default, they label all the requests. So it's easy for people to tell that they're being scanned. So uh, there we are. So anyway, this, this one packet answers several of the questions in the Capture the Flag contest. Uh, so let me 
put that on the screen here. I'll just drag it over. All right. So here's the first few. You want to find the name of the scanner. You want to find the attacker's IP, the web server's IP. So those three, you can answer as soon as you find one of these scan packets. You can see the name of the scanner right here. And that is traffic that came from an attacker to me. So the source IP right here, that's the IP address of the machine being used to scan us. And the destination IP is the IP address of the web server. So you have three flags right there. And the other one I wanted to show you uh, because it really shows why people pay a pile of money for Splunk. So I have a million events. Now I've just looked through the web events and found a common kind of web traffic. But now I'm going to find the traffic that went backwards through my network. So consider this. If I um, find the source IP here, source, source might work, source IP might work better. There's two values for source IP for web traffic. If I click that, some of it came from this address and some of it came from that address. And what I would like to know is, is there data that came from my web server? So I'm going to filter by source IP and paste in that value that I just found for the web server itself. And if I search for this, I'm going to find no events. Now, this is what you should expect to find. If you have a properly organized network, it will not let anybody go on your server and open a browser and surf the internet. You're not supposed to do that, both because you might download malware and infect the server, and also because when attackers attack you, they're gonna put malware on your server, and then it's gonna try to make a outgoing connection to the command and control server for a reverse shell, and you don't want to allow that. So your server should only be a server and never a client. If you want to put a file on the web server, you do it another way through the network. You don't, you don't let the server directly connect to the internet. But this server is misconfigured and that happened. Now I'm not seeing it here because I left this domain name here. And since that's the domain name of my web server, none of the requests coming out of the web server are going to have that domain in it. So I have to get rid of that. And now I'll find if there is any traffic going backwards through my network. And there are just a few events here. It's finding one, it's going to eventually find eight or nine. Okay, there's eight events here. These are malicious events doing something that shouldn't be happening where my web server is phoning out. And here you see it's a get for an image with an obviously malicious name, a JPEG image. It's going to some ridiculous domain name on a strange port, port 1337. This is obviously a hostile server that the criminals have used to host malicious files and I'm connecting to it to download files to deface the web server. So this is the next couple of flags here that you find that way, the defacement file name and the domain name. And I like this because it shows you what good Splunk is. This was not really very hard to do. And I just found the eight malicious events out of a million events, which is very nice. And there are open source tools like uh, Elasticsearch that can do this. And they're in between tools um, like logarithm that do this. Splunk is the most expensive, most luxurious tool, and it's what most large companies use because it's worth paying the money for the convenience. And also there's a huge community writing uh, tutorials and uh, plugins and all sorts of things. So Splunk is the leader and therefore it's the best one for my students to learn. Anyway, so that should get you started. Start doing these and solving challenges. And I'll post this video and then come back to demonstrate some more. Sam, can I demonstrate how to submit answers into the scoreboard? Yeah, why don't you do that? Good point. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you'll need to make you, me co-host. Do I have to give you permission? I think I do. Yeah. Uh, right, let me make you a co-host. Yes, please do. That's important. Good. Co-host, there you are. And I'll stop sharing. Good. All right, so I've been seeing some questions on how to submit answers. So at the top of the page, you will see scoreboard and submit flags. If you click on scoreboard, you'll see where everybody stands. Enter flag is where you submit your flags. So uh, we're, if we're, since we're talking about boss of the sock, scrolling down to where the questions are, you'll see that there's bots v1 1, 1 1.1. So in the enter flag, you'll select bots, vers, uh, bots v1 and the first you know, shows up there. If you're working on 1.2, you would select that. This name is your name. So it is not the name of the challenge that is defined here. 
here you put the your name as it will appear on the scoreboard and then the the flag answer that you want and then you hit submit then if, if you're right you'll show up on the board so right now i see two people uh messed up and that's okay you just resubmit your uh your flag with your name and then it'll populate in the scoreboard as you work through other challenges like let's say uh ed 200 and you're making a Google Cloud, you know, at ED200. So up on the flags, you go for ED, and there's ED201. If you're working uh, in the IR section, because you chose that's what you want to work on, again, you see the section. So in Enter Flags, switch to IR, that's 301, so not 201. Where's 301? There it is. So that, that's how you would go about finding your the questions and then entering them into the CTF uh, board so that you show up on the scoreboard. Okay, good. Thank you. Let me post this video. I forgot where my stop button is. There we are.